Good morning, Scott Davis from TechWise Group. Today is April 24th, 2020, and it's Arbor Day. The first documented Arbor Day was actually celebrated in 1594 in the Spanish village of Mondonado. Uh, so a lot of history uh, around celebrating the trees. The Small Business Administration, SBA, is offering credit monitoring and a million dollar insur insurance policy to the 7,913 potentially infected businesses that were breached earlier this month, late last month. If you've paid attention to my videos previously, uh, there was an issue with the uh, one fund that SBA was offering as part of the whole COVID coronavirus for small businesses. Uh, and those that applied early, uh, apparently there was a breach associated with those. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, hackers have published more than 2,000 usernames and passwords for the World Health Organization, the CDC, the NIH, and the Gates Foundation into the dark web. There's been no shortage of conversations that health organizations are a topic of breach. Um, here, in this case, hackers are targeting specifically the WHO, CDC, NIH, and Gates Foundation. All are heavy players in just the overall process and procedure of what's going on in the COVID-19 coronavirus recovery. Across the pond, hackers trick three British firms into sending $1.3 million. So how do they do it? Um, this case, this situation, like many others, uh, started with a spear phishing to the high profile individuals. This is typically information that you can learn just by social media or going to your company website. Next, once they get successful uh, usernames and passwords, they created Outlook rules that would divert, you know, potential critical emails to this third party, these hackers. Then once they have good emails, they create lookalike domains. So, <coughs> for example, if you do a lot of banking with Bank of America and you're getting ready to close on a big loan with Bank of America, um, here, you know, they may come up bank of the americas.com instead of bank of america.com so they're creating look-alike domains so it's critical to watch that two field and make sure it's the person that's sending you the email and doesn't just look like the person that's sending you the email once the look-alike domains are created emails now communicating back and forth with you through that look-alike domain or that fraudulent domain and that's when they inject the fraudulent bank account information um, so this type of an attack is called a BEC or a business email compromise. Uh, it's been sounded the alarm by the FBI previously. Uh, I saw a trend, uh, late last year, uh, like mid late, mid to late last year, uh, with the real estate industry, especially in California, where a lot of the home deals are million dollar plus. Well, these hackers in that case would go through those same steps where they divert those emails. They'd look for the large home sales create you know look-alike email addresses of the seller and then at the very last minute inject new bank account information for the realtor to send payment to so there's a lot going on there um i think ultimately before you send a large payment to anybody especially one that's recently had bank account information on pick up the phone call and verify Nintendo has announced that up to 160,000 accounts were breached through its Nintendo Network ID, or the NNID. This includes users' nicknames, emails, date of birth, gender, and country. The NNID has currently been disabled, and all affected accounts will have their passwords reset. Some users through social media have reported unusual charges to their accounts that were tied to the NNID for digital items mostly. The thing that I recommend most in situations like this is almost every service, including Nintendo, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, have the capability of using 2FA or MFA, multi-factor authentication. And what 2FA MFA does is when you go to log in, you have your username, your password, common, but then it takes you to another step of that second step of typing in a six digit code. So typically on your mobile phone, uh, your smartphone, tablet, etc. you have an app. It's typically Microsoft Authenticator or Google Authenticator, and there's a number of others out there that display a random six-digit code. That matches the random six-digit code 
that's on the back end server that gives a validation that you not only know the password, but you have access to that code. And that is your second term, uh, second form of authentication. So <coughs> again, excuse me, using MFA 2FA is a great step to stopping this type of a threat. Um, as even if they get your username and password, it's invaluable without, without that MFA 2FA. Malwarebytes has launched Malwarebytes Privacy Service, which is providing a secure VPN. Um, the secure VPN is not going to log your online activities. And up front, uh, they're giving you the choice of connection to over 30 countries. A lot of conversations even that I've had uh, with clients and even with you over the, uh, the daily news is VPN is, a secure, is an added way to secure your home network, uh, at least your work communication. So when you're working at home for work, if you have the capability to VPN into the office, VPN into the office, that's giving you some added security safeguards that you wouldn't have if you were just using your home network. So VPNs are more secure. Uh, sometimes there is a degradation of service. Malwarebytes Privacy says it has a very low degradation of service. Um, I haven't tested it yet, but keep an eye out for that new service by Malwarebytes Privacy. They're not the only VPN player in the game, but obviously Malwarebytes has a good name uh, in the malware fighting industry, and ultimately I see success with their Malwarebytes Privacy. Yesterday, I mentioned Trustwave's 2020 Global Security Report. Today, I want to dig into a little bit more of the numbers than just what I mentioned yesterday. First, phishing was the source of 50% of the breaches. Application exploits and malicious insiders came in second at both 11%. <coughs> oh, these sinuses are killing me. They're going to kill me, I tell you. <laughs> Anyways, um, the next one here, days between intrusion and detection went from 55 to 86 days for externally detected incidents. So that is the number of days that it takes for you to find out that you were potentially breached. Uh, so if I use the three British firms that I mentioned above, um, and it roughly, you know, it could take days, it could take weeks, it could take months, it could even take years to determine that a breach took place. The average is now 86 days uh, for those externally detected incidents from intrusion to detection. Things like ransomware, it's easy to detect because as soon as you get it, you know, within an hour, all your files say encrypted at the end or have a weird file and you can't open the file anymore. So it makes it easy to determine with ransomware what that is. But cases like BECs, those email, business email compromises, it can take time to discover. Only 0.2% of spam messages actually contained malware. This is down from 6% in 2018. Uh, meanwhile, 9% of spam messages were phishing lures, which is up from 3%. So there's definitely a transition of actual malware versus let's just gain the information with those phishing lures as that's really more valuable than just injecting the malware. 47% of emailed malware was delivered via Microsoft Word. So, you know, I mentioned only 0.2% of spam messages actually contain the malware. Well, what they're doing instead is they're including links to a Microsoft Word file or they're attaching a Microsoft Word file that when opened has a link to another third party. So there's no malware in the email. There's no malware in the Word document. It's a link to a third party where the malware is sitting. So Microsoft Word is extremely common. We see it a lot with HR departments where you're opening Word files constantly <coughs> for resumes. So if you think about it, how many resumes, you know, in any given time period are you opening that are just Microsoft Word? The important thing to remember with those Word files is if it comes up and it asks you to elevate your permissions or enable macros, close the Word immediately and call your IT department. Um, TC, TCP port 3389 was fourth place on the list of targeted ports. I expect this number to go up in the 2020 global security report just because of how quickly industries have had to allow remote work from home capability here in 2020 with the whole COVID coronavirus. 
And why that's important is 3389 is remote desktop. It's the simplest way to get connected into another computer. And if people aren't aware of the security ramifications of this, IT people may have just opened up TCP port to enable or even end users may have just opened up 3389 to get remote connection to a system. Um, it is a targeted port. It is an easy port to access. Uh, and typically, once you're in, it's you know a great place to do those brute force login attacks. The last piece, retail industry was the most targeted with 24% of the attacks. Uh, next was finance and insurance with 14%. I expect to see healthcare kind of in that top two, in that top three maybe, uh, going into 2021's report, just because there's so many attacks right now hitting the healthcare industry. But retail is always going to be a threat because it's a treasure trove of information, um, as is finance and insurance. And it's all really about the PII that's collected on the back end of these breaches. So that is what I have for you today. It is, again, April 24th. It is Friday. It is Arbor Day. If you can't plant a tree today because of the weather, uh, plant a tree over the weekend uh, and celebrate Arbor Day with your family. Have a great weekend, everyone. And I will see you all on Monday. Thanks for tuning in.